Rules Committee to order. At this time, we will do the invocation. Councilor Taylor, would you do the honors? Thank you for that. Roll call, Shelley. Yes, sir. Joe Bird. Honey. Hayden Duncan. Honey. Keith Austin. Yes. Harley Buzzard. Yes. Julia Cope. Here. Sean Crittenden. Honey. Joe Deere. Honey. Mike Dobbins. Here. Rex Jordan. Here. Daryl Legg. Here. Wes Snowfire. Honey. Dora Petskowski. Here. Mike Shambaugh. Mary Baker Shaw. E.O. Smith. Here. Janice Taylor. Here. Victoria Vesquez. We have a quorum. <clears throat> Thank you, Shelley. This time I entertain approval of the minutes. You got a motion and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. Moving down reports, Marshal Service, Shannon Buell. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, first, uh, some updates that's not in my report. Uh, since the budget was passed earlier this month, uh, I can tell you that we're moving uh, fast and furious to try to get more hired equipment order for the McGurk decision that we're expecting to come out in February. Uh, I would really like to say thank you to the Attorney General's office for really picking up the pace with us to being a team player to making this happen. Uh, human resources has absolutely been over backwards to try to get our positions uh, listed, positions filled. Uh, that is a daunting task with the numbers that we're looking at, and they, they knocked it out of the park getting there quick. And finally, uh, Trey Leonard with Finance, uh, they've been over backwards, worked day and night to make sure our uh, uh, budget is, looks good, is in. Uh, we can start getting the equipment and getting the funding that we funding that we need to make this happen. So, other than that, uh, we've had three physical fitness tests for Deputy Marshal, one physical fitness test for uh, a, a transport officer. Uh, we've had uh, we have one more physical fitness test scheduled for hopefully next week, and that should give us a good panel of people, um, uh, candidates to look at uh, to go finish up the hiring process. We're working fast to get uh, good quality people in here to, to help us and the nation out. So with that, if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. Any questions for our marshal? Yes, Councillor Duncan. Hey, Marshall, I get a lot of uh, questions from, from, from young folks that are interested in They've maybe been out of high school for a few years and um, no college, but they're interested in becoming a marshal. Um, what, what's your advice on where to send them? Because I know there's uh, training. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, uh, my recommendation is with somebody uh, to, to even apply to be a deputy marshal, you have to have some minimal experience. Uh, one of the things we're doing with this transport officer position is uh, there's no experience required for that position. So uh, a person could apply to be a transport officer. Uh, we'll train them, we'll send them to CLEAT, uh, get their CLEAT certification, and then they start getting time and service to get that needed experience before they apply to be a deputy marshal. Thank you, Marshal. Anybody else? Yes, Councilor, no fire. <clears throat> hey, I just wanna make a quick comment and a big, big thank you to you and your, your workforce. I uh, actually had a high school friend of mine that went missing and his family were, were really, really uh, worried about him. They, they feared for the worst. He'd been missing, I think, since July. And your deputies, you know, they went out there, they did the investigation and luckily found him safe and happy and seemed to be on the men's and his family is extremely appreciative of what you guys do. I know I am. So uh, a big what oh to, to everyone up there. So, but appreciate it, Chair. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> yes, Councilor Shambaugh. Yes, sir. Um, hey, Shannon. Just like to say, uh, appreciate uh, you. You're going to send out several marshals to watch Jay. We have a officer that has passed, and you know we are going to his funeral. And we we surely appreciate you sending some marshals to watch our town for a couple hours, so we can attend. Um, that's we all of my guys just wanted to tell you thank you, and and uh, uh, they're very uh, happy that the way they, we can all go as a department. So thank you. Well, we'll be there in the morning. We'll be there until you need us. So, thank you, sir. Anybody else? Good report, Marshal. Appreciate you. Thank you. Office of the Attorney General, Sarah Hill. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot going on and we have a lot to report, but I will do the best I can to hit the high points. Um, in our, the first thing I want to talk about was our business interruption case. As you all probably remember, several months ago, we filed suit against our insurers um, who were not going to cover our losses related to the interruption of our business uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I'm pleased to report that the district court in Cherokee County recently ruled in our favor on several legal issues, which were important to the case. Um, it's not concluded, but having that interim, um, having those rulings by the district court that yes, we, you know, the, the legal, the law is what we believed it was and that they are gonna be required to cover those losses is a good step forward. So. It's a long way from over, but I wanted to report to you that we'd had a, a positive outcome in that case um, in Cherokee County. On, um, there's an issue, an ongoing issue, a couple of ongoing issues re that relate to the United Katua Band. Um, the United Katua Band had notified the NIGC that they intended to initiate gaming and, and licensing for gaming at their River Brew House location and at, at, at some location on the 76 acre track that they have in trust. Um, the nation filed suit in the Northern District um, asking that, that, not, that, that they not be able to license those activities. Um, fortunately, uh, DKB has voluntarily withdrawn their notice to the NIGC at this point, so that was a welcome change. And we likewise withdrew our suit when they withdrew their notice to the NIGC. So um, that's, the case was filed and it's now it's not needed and so I've withdrawn it, but I will remain vigilant in, in protecting the nation's sovereignty in those matters. There's another UKB case. The UKB challenged Cherokee Nation's tribal court system and federal court, arguing that the nation's courts were illegitimate and lacked authority to decide cases involving Cherokee children. Um, the federal court ruled against the UKB in that case, but they have appealed it to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and so their opening brief is due, I believe, on February 26th at this point. So we will continue to, uh, we were pleased about our victory at the district court and we will continue um, on the appeal to protect the nation's sovereignty in that respect. Um, the, the two acre fee case, so there's a, a two acre parcel of property that they are um, attempting to take into trust. Um, that case, the nation prevailed at the district court and it is also on appeal at the 10th circuit. It's still, it's still on appeal at the 10th circuit. So there's been no real changes to that case. As it relates to McGirt, um, you know, this has been the biggest area of work for the nation, for the, the AG's office over the last month and over the last several months. We've added another paralegal to our AG's staff. Um, she has a lot of experience with criminal cases and I think she'll be an asset to our office. We posted another assistant attorney general position which closed yesterday. So I'm looking forward to receiving the applications um, from, from that. So we'll be able to hopefully hire um, some more attorneys here in the very near future. So we continue to add to our staff one of the changes that we've seen just this week, uh, we received from the Northern District of Oklahoma, the first referrals from cases that occurred on the reservation. So the United States has looked at cases that they're, they're sending to us and saying, we, we're not gonna prosecute these cases, but we believe that they should be referred to you for prosecution. So, and these are cases that happened on the reservation, not cases that happen on tribal trust or restricted land. So this is the first cases we've been sent from the United States uh, for acts that occurred on the reservation. 
and are, we're busy working on filing those cases, and you'll probably see many more criminal cases filed. By the next time I see you, uh, we'll have filed quite a number of criminal cases in the district court. We're beginning to file those now. Um, so we're still waiting on the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals. I expect we'll see a ruling from them in the very near future. I believe, you know, sometime in the next, probably in the next four weeks, uh, we will have some kind of decision from the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals. And that will, of course, you know, continue to increase the number of cases that we receive. There is a gaming lawsuit that we filed in Washington, D.C., which you have, may remember me talking about before. Um, while the automatic renewal fight was going on with the governor, um, he entered into four new compacts with different tribes in Oklahoma. Compacts that were not the model compact that the other tribes had signed, but brand new compacts with different and unique terms. Um, the Oklahoma Supreme Court had taken up two cases relating to these compacts. One case was over the Comanche and Ota Missouri compacts, and the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled that they were not valid because they had not been approved by the legislature. Mm -hmm. There were two other compacts, one by the UKB and one by the Kailiji Tribal Town that were in a separate lawsuit on, on very similar issues. And this week, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled in that case and also ruled that they were invalid because the governor did not have the authority alone to enter into those compacts with those terms. So that's a, a complete, I think that's the, you know, a good outcome in that it highlights that there's a model compact and the, all, the, all the other tribes in Oklahoma are subject to, and if the governor wants to enter into additional compacts, he's going to need the legislature to do that. This, um, we also have a lawsuit, the remaining issue then, of course, the Oklahoma Supreme Court's ruled in that case, uh, but they, these compacts were, the, were sent up to the Department of the Interior for approval and they didn't do anything. They didn't approve them, they didn't disapprove them, which means they're considered deemed approved uh, by the federal agency, which we think was inappropriate for them to do that. And so we have, we have filed a lawsuit along with the Choctaws, the Chickasaw Nation, and the Citizen Potawatomi to get the federal courts to ask the Department of the Interior to sort of clean up this mess that the department allowed to be created by allowing these compacts to be deemed approved. So that case continues. But obviously the recent ruling by the Oklahoma Supreme Court continues to assist us in, in getting getting the, the right decision out of the court. There are two new um, Supreme Court of the United States CERT grants that are relevant to the Cherokee Nation. One of them is U.S. v. Cooley. Um, that case involves a tribal officer who pulled over a non-Indian on the reservation. Um, and during that stop, it was a public right-of-way on the reservation. Um, and it was based upon a potential violation of state or federal law that's been challenged. The lower court said that basically the evidence that he found during that stop had to be suppressed because he didn't have jurisdiction over that non-Indian, um, even to stop him for a potential violation of state or federal law. There was not a cross-deputization agreement in this case, which would make it different than the sort of circumstances that would probably arise on our reservation, but still an important issue in, in criminal law in, in Indian country. And we, have, um, we, we are participating in an amicus on that at the Supreme Court. The other case that was decided was Mnuchin uh, versus the Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis Reservation, and that was a CARES Act funding case. And that has to do with the Alaskan Native Corporations and whether or not they're entitled to be considered Indian tribes for CARES Act funding purposes. And that case was a case that had been decided in the tribes, in the favor of, of the federally recognized tribes, that the Alaska Native Corporations could not take part of that CARES Act funding, and they have appealed that to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they have accepted cert. So we're still reviewing that case to see whether there's any value in, in filing an amicus in that case. So that's the, the high points um, since the last time we've spoken, cases at the federal and the state and, and at the tribal level that are relevant to the work that we're doing, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. <clears throat> any questions for our Attorney General? Yes, Councilor Crittenden. Yes, sir. The, the cases that's been referred to you, um, have they, are they all going to be under our, the thing that we can impose the three years? Yes. They've all been under, no, no murder or any of those crimes referred to us yet? Well, there three of them are manslaughter cases. Um, so they're, they're serious cases. The maximum penalty that the nation can impose for those cases will be, for, for that offense, will be three years. Now, there may be other offenses wrapped up in some of those cases, because sometimes a manslaughter case may involve other offenses. Um, and potentially, we could impose up to three years per offense. But they are serious cases. Three of the four that we were referred were manslaughter. Okay. So not understanding the law here uh, as much as a lot of people do. So 
manslaughter, we get that case, and you just said there may be other offenses. You could add three years to each offense and kind of add up the, the time they would serve, right? The maximum that, they call that stacking, and the maximum sentence that a tribe can stack is nine years. Okay, and uh, manslaughter cases, is that, I'm sure each case is different. Yeah. But it's, it's still, it's still concerning to a lot of folks that, you know, some of these cases may, you know, they should go away for a lot longer than what we can hand them. And um, I'm sure you guys are on top of that, still discussing that. But I've raised it a few times, but is that one of the major things that we're kind of worried about is when we get these major crimes, uh, you know, essentially just letting some somebody do less time than they should get. Yeah, it's it's definitely an it's it's one of several issues that yeah we ha we definitely need to to discuss and and it's I mean there are going to be a manslaughter case, you know, is a very serious crime and um, and yeah I think there are legitimate criticisms that, that you know the tribe could the, the most I, uh, the nation could ever get it for that offense is three years and even if it's possible to stack other offenses there are people who will feel like that it's difficult to provide justice if the maximum that you can get for that offense is three years and that's just in our reservation right yes that's where they'll be coming yes and you know a lot of people if they're released that's where they'll be staying you know so yeah it's and i appreciate and i know you guys are on top of it and uh, that's kind of <coughs> weighed heavy on my mind is what what we're going to do, but I trust you guys are going to figure it out. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Okay. Counselor Julia Coates. Yes. Thank you. I apologize. I'm having trouble with um, the video. Uh, I can't see the meeting right now, and I also can't turn on my camera, but thank you for calling on me. Um, I have a question for uh, the AG or for anyone who can respond to it that I received from a constituent, and um, she said the newspaper today said that President Biden signed an executive order that increases the sovereignty of Native American tribes. What does that mean for the Cherokee Nation? I'm unclear as to what she's even referring to. That's such a general statement. Can you venture a guess as to what this might be about? I will venture a guess, Councilwoman. That's the best I can do. I, I suspect it has to do with a recent executive order he signed about tribal consultation. Um, and in the Obama administration, um, there was a, a more sophisticated policy about tribal consultation for various federal actions. And under the Trump administration, that was changed. And I think that, that for the most part, he is, he is reinstating that more broad and more robust tribal consultation rule. And I suspect that that's what she's referring to, although, of course, I can't be sure, but that's my suspicion. Very good. Thank you so much. <laughs> <clears throat> Councillor Coates, if you wish, we can send you a copy of that executive order from the president. I think that was signed, uh, was that uh, Monday, maybe? It was this week for sure. I yes. don't remember the exact date. Yeah. We'll have Gail send you a copy of that if you wish, Councillor Coates. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. And I think actually that our own Kim Teehee was involved in the original drafting of that policy, so she could probably answer more specific questions about it than I could. Okay. All right. Councilor Duncan. Hey, General. So I got a, a question I've, I've had from a few constituents, and I read up on it a little myself, but Oklahoma, um, the Oklahoma State Tax Commission just put out a, a, a white paper over Administrative Code 17, um, about Indians living within a reservational boundary um, being exempt from uh, income tax. <clears throat> is there any, are you familiar with this, and is there any type of information that we can be given out to, to folks about it? That's, um, I am familiar with it, and I think that, um, you know, those are issues. I don't, uh, today I can't speak to that really, you know, I, I don't think I can give you much guidance on that, and, and really for anybody, a lot of these issues are going to be an income tax issue for a citizen is that a personal claim that they have. And there are circumstances under state law where an Indian who, whose income is derived from the reservation, from sources on the reservation, does not have to pay income tax. 
but whether or not you're one of those Indians who falls under that circumstance is going to be very, very related to the facts of your own income, where it's derived from, um, whether or not you're living on your reservation or living on the reservation of another tribe. So there are a lot of different factors that go into that, that it's difficult to give any individual guidance on that because it's very fact specific. But I am familiar with the exemption in the law. And um, I think that maybe we could, you know, speak about that a little bit more, um, you know, in, a, in, in the following this meeting. But that, I think for individuals, it's difficult to talk to them about their situation without falling into the trap of telling them something that doesn't apply to them because there are facts of which we're not completely knowledgeable. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate that. So, um, you know, maybe we can discuss it more next meeting because um, the way it read to me and then as citizens are understanding it since McGirt has came down is, which I know didn't talk about uh, civil taxation, but is, is that um, living within the Cherokee Nation 14 County Reservation is, is going to exempt Cherokee individuals from, from income tax. But, um, and, and I didn't, I wasn't clear on it. That's just the way it looked to me. And so there are circumstances where I, I think there are, are circumstances where that is true, and there are circumstances where it's it's complicated. I mean, it's it's going to be complicated for individuals. Thank you, General. Councilor Dobbins. Uh, yes, General Hill. Uh, what what is the status of the criminal justice compact that we were striving for? So, there is the at this time there is no authority to enter into compacts relating to criminal jurisdiction. So we don't have authority to enter into such compacts. The, that authority, if we receive it, would have to come from Congress. So it would take action by Congress to authorize the tribe and the state to enter in compacting for any, for any of these cases. So right now it's, it's only a concept um, and it will have to be a, an act of Congress to, to provide the authority we would need to enter into a compact. Well, in, in your view, uh is Congress looking for a unified front from the tribes? Because there's a, it doesn't seem as though all the tribes are on board with this concept of a criminal justice compact. Well, it's hard to say what any, you know, what any Congress person individually might do, let alone Congress as a group. Um, but I, I mean, I think that those are questions that I can't answer, Councilman. Okay. Um, I think that we have to advocate for what we think is best for the Cherokee Nation and other tribes, of course, are free to do the same. Um, and I would like to think that, you know, we wouldn't be held hostage by the fact that we have different views and, and different things that we think we need. But um, I can't speak as to what Congress is waiting for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, General. Thank you, Chair. Anybody else? Councilor <clears throat> uh, Regarding the, um, uh, the cases that are being handed over to us, uh, what is it that triggers a case being handed to the federal courts as opposed to us? So the, the federal courts typically get you know, two different, different kinds of cases. They get the major crimes. So there's a list of what's considered a major crime. And all of those cases that involve an Indian in any way, whether an Indian was a victim or whether the Indian was the perpetrator, those cases should be referred to the United States for them to review. And then the United States makes their own prosecutorial decision about that. Well, we like that case and we do think we will prosecute that one. Or for some reason, it's not a priority to us and we are going to refer that one to the tribe because we think the tribe can prosecute that. So if it was a major crime, but maybe a less serious major crime, they might look at it and say, well, the, in this case, the defendant is an Indian. The cr tribe could prosecute this, so I'm going to give this to the tribe to prosecute because it's that's, that's in line with our priorities at our office. Um, so that's one group. The other group of cases they get are cases that are committed by a non-Indian against an Indian on the reservation. And that includes not just the major crimes, but even less serious crimes. Those get referred to the United States as well. So are, um, uh, we're not the people who get to make that decision. The no. decision is made by who? The decision is made by the U.S. Attorney. Okay. So they decide what cases, and they have their own um, guidelines and their own, you know, the, the, they, the they make those decisions else, okay? about what they want to prosecute. And then we have to decide, I have to decide when I receive those cases, whether it's a case I want to pursue on behalf of the nation or whether it's a case that doesn't need to be pursued at all. Okay, so your choices are yes, we pursue or or we uh, drop the case. Right. Okay. Thank you. Right, Councilor Mary Shaw. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, a while ago you were talking about uh, 
federal taxation. I wanted to ask you a question about state taxes. If a Cherokee works for Cherokee Nation <laughs> and they live inside jurisdiction, do they have to pay state income taxes? Okay, I should be clear before. I, I thought you were asking me about state taxation, Councilman Duncan. So, okay, okay. Yeah, that's, that's state. Now, federal income taxes are unaffected by the reservation status altogether. So it's really only about state taxation. And that was the, I was responding to him with that understanding, Councilwoman. We just covered that, Baker Shell. Okay, I thought she was talking federal. I'm sorry. And I, I may have said that, but I, I was speaking to the state taxation issues. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Councilor Shembo. Sarah, I was wondering, I've had several questions about um, post-conviction relief. Do we have attorneys who, since the McGirt decisions come up and everybody's filing post-conviction relief cases, do we, does the Cherokee Nation have attorneys that can help people who are currently incarcerated who may be available for post-conviction relief? The nation does not represent def criminal defendants in any capacity. Um, the only time when you would ever have an attorney appointed is in a case where they are facing tribal court charges and they are indigent and they have a tribal attorney appointed to them um, through that process, a public defender. But that would be the only circumstance where the nation would ever, ever represent a criminal defendant. Okay. And one other short one. Um, if we do get a compact, if Congress does come through with the compact, um, what will that do to the Major Crimes Act? Will that make it null and void or, I mean, depending what the contract is or, or what? I mean, nothing can make the major, I mean, I guess Congress could make the Major Crimes Act null and void, but I don't think that that's ever really been contemplated. What they're, what they're really talking about doing is lifting federal preemption, um, which is lift, because right now the, the state cannot charge people because the, they're federally preempted from doing that. So it'd be lifting federal preemption so that charges could be filed by the state. That wouldn't necessarily divest the, the federal government of jurisdiction, um, but it would instead give another opportunity for the state to assert jurisdiction in certain circumstances. And also, I mean, a compact can be whatever the tribe and the state need it to be. Like the terms could be different depending on what the tribe and the state agree are the priorities that they want to address. But I don't think it would be about erasing Major Crimes Act jurisdiction. I, th I think it's gonna be interesting in that if the Supreme Court or Oklahoma Supreme Court um, says, hey, we affirm this decision and whether it's uh, whatever case comes up first, immediately um, that's going to change the ball game, correct? Correct. Now, okay. With that being said, um, if it happened, let's say in a week, and that case was affirmed, then because there are no com compacts, um, we basically would be required to do this alone. The Cherokee Nation, we would have to take care of our own alone, right off the bat, right? That, that, that's correct, and that, that's what we have been preparing to do. Yeah, I know. Okay, well, um, Boy, that's a, that's a daunting task for the amount of uh, cases we're going to get as opposed to how many marshals we have hired. That's going to be, that's going to be something I know our court system will be tasked. And even, you know, we, we talked about tickets, you know, and different things uh, that are written in municipalities and district courts and, and by even troopers where they go. Gosh, you got your hands full, ma'am. And, um, I want to wish you the best of luck, but I also know that you guys have done a good job, and I know you've you've thought of all these things. But you know, just to kind of hear it, it's kind of it's daunting. It really is. So thank you for all you do. Um, I'm happy to do it. I'm I'm happy to be here when the nation needs me. Um, but I would like to say that no one told me when I became Attorney General that this is what I signed up for. I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> sure. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Anybody else? A couple things, Sarah. In the evening news last night, I saw one of the state representatives uh, uh, say they were going to present uh, legislation that would prevent and make it unlawful of wearing masks or even taking a vaccination. If hypothetical that were to pass, it would not affect us as a sovereign, correct? That's correct. Good. 
because the state, they can do what they want because they need to take our lead on how we handle things. They might learn something. Uh, and I was wondering if we had an orientation on tribal sovereignty, would the governor attend to that so he could learn about tribal issues and tribal rights? He is a tribal member, correct? He is a tribal member. We um, might have the chief invite him onto a, a, you know, the definition of what tribal sovereignty really means. He could okay. probably learn a lot from our, our, our government. Our state leader could learn a lot from talking to our tribal leader. That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> One more thing. When the, our executive director of education gave the report, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I asked him, and I'll ask you as well, would you research and, and, and think about how our, our, our students that we have uh, placed throughout uh, the 14 counties that, that participate at Sequoia High School, if they have eligibility remaining and they choose to want to come back next year, would you research and see how we can get a letter and, and convince the OSSAA that they should be allowed to come back under the extreme circumstances they had to leave Sequoia and go to these other schools. Would you research that? Yes, and I, um, I've, I'm familiar enough with OSSAA rules um, that I think it's going to take a, a real, um, a real political, you know, some real political leadership to get them to appreciate that. The, 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 from a legal point, the rulemaking of it um, is complicated. We certainly will look at it, though, uh, Mr. Okay. Speaker. Okay, appreciate it. Any more questions? Sarah, you and your staff do an outstanding job. I know you got a, a lot on your plate, but we really appreciate having your, your staff and, and the caliber that you guys do and taking care of all of our cases here. So keep up the good work. If there's anything we can do from our end, don't hesitate. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Gwen Terrapin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, for our calendar year 2020, we had 10 FOIA requests. Two of those are still outstanding, but we didn't have any GRA requests. And for 2021 so far, we've had five requests, and those five are still outstanding, and no GRA requests. Everything's been updated on the website, and everyone should have gotten a copy of my report. Okay, any questions for Gwen? Thank you very much. Good report. Thank you. Next uh, election commission, uh, Marcus Fears. Anybody from election commission available? There he is. Okay. You're up, Marcus. Any questions for Marcus? Okay, Councilor Shaw. Yeah, Marcus, can you please tell us what type of voting machines do we use? Those kinds. I'm sorry, did he answer? Can he hear me? Marcus, we cannot hear you. You can hear me, Marcus? Nod your head. Marcus, can you hear Councillor Shaw? Okay. I guess they can talk and we can't hear. No, I can't hear him. Is he muted? State your question, Councillor Shaw. Hi, Marcus. Marcus, I'd like to know what type of voting machines do we use? Are they Dominion? Terry Lee, what kind of voting machines do we use? I wish I knew the answer to that, Speaker Bird. I can find out for you. Okay. He says yes. 
Counselor Shaw, we'll have to get back with you on those machines. Okay. Thank you so much. What a. I think he's speaking to the chief of staff. He's talking to chief of staff. <laughs> Okay, we can't hear him. We're just going to have to go to the next. Are you on the phone with him? Yes. Um, so um, I advised Marcus to go ahead and disconnect and he's going to call in. Yes. Uh, but he did uh, share with me that he wasn't for certain the manufacturer of the voting machines that they use. Uh, he would have to check on that to, to respond, but he's going to call back in and okay. via phone. Good. Okay. Tax Commission, Sharon Swepston. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sharon. Um, I believe you do have my report. I'll try to answer any questions that you might have regarding it. Any questions for Sharon? Yes, Councilor Buzzard. Uh, Sharon, just looking at your report, and, and I guess it's a good thing. I see all the, uh, the uh, tobacco taxes is 10 to 50 percent down is that because of the pandemic or other reasons or do you know i i don't think it's totally due to the pandemic i think it's a lot of things that are going on where the prices of the tax have gone up and just of course the move to get people to stop smoking and everything but i don't think it's totally entirely due to the pandemic I think that it has impacted it some because where, as you know, most of our smoke shops are not located in town and things like that. So it, I think it has impacted them some. And we had limited them for a long time to drive through, but most of them said they didn't feel like that that had hurt them that badly. And it was trying to keep everyone safe also, so. I see. Do you have any, uh, you have any estimate of numbers, dollar amount wise, of what that may be? I didn't, I, I do. I do not, but I can see what I can come up with for you. Okay, that'd be interesting to say. Thank you, Sharon. Hey. Uh-huh. Anybody else? Yes, Councilor Legg. Hi, Sharon. This is Councilman Legg. So when a, uh, at the smoke shops, do we collect tax if they sell Coca-Cola, uh, anything like yes. that that's sold out of there, we collect taxes on it? Yes, we have a retail sales tax. I got you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Anybody else? At this point, Sharon, are we, are we, uh, have we scheduled our uh, reception for our school administrators? Or is that too early to um, tell? We have, we, I, not that I'm aware of exactly when it's going to be. Education usually does that. So they're the ones that usually schedule it. They get with the schools and everything, and they try to schedule that. But I haven't heard anything on it. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Good report. Thank you. Thank you. Gaming Commission, Janice Purcell. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I submitted my report the end of December. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions for Janice Purcell? I think everybody's satisfied, Janice. We appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. Human Resources, Atlanta Castile. Good afternoon. Um, I have nothing to add to my report. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer those for you. Any questions for Janice? I mean, Atlanta Castile and Human Resources? If not, thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Okay. Before we go to old business, if, if the committee would, would uh, desire, we have Chad Hershaw out there to give us a brief, less than five minute report on the land we just acquired, if that's all right with the committee. Okay. Chad Hershaw, you're up. Less than five minutes. Yeah, thank, thank you, Speaker. Um, in, in terms of an update, do you want me to speak to the land we just acquired or the legislative act that we have up for consideration this afternoon? Both. Briefly over the land we just purchased. Okay, yeah, so we recently purchased. Do you have your button pressed? All right, you're good. Is that good? Okay. All right. 
Yeah, we recently just purchased about 4,300 acres in Sequoia County, um, which is a, a contiguous property that's been used historically for hunting and fishing reserve. Uh, this purchase um, was, was, was made for a number of reasons. One, to help support our um, food security initiatives, um, and also um, as an opportunity in place for um, COVID isolation for individuals who have been impacted by that disease. Well, one of the ideas that we've had is incorporating this property into a larger program, which is up for consideration uh, this, this afternoon on this agenda, which is our Hunting, hunting uh, Fishing Preserves Act, which is a um, holistic review of the properties that we have available for the public and retooling that in such a way as to make it um, you know, available for beneficial uses and also identifying areas of, of degradation. So, um, you know, this piece of property is going to be open to the public in, in a number of different fashions. One of the ideas that we've, we've looked at is um, an opportunity for controlled hunts with elders and, and partnerships with our veterans programs and youth. Um, and so, you know, this property is in pristine condition and part of what we're doing right now is identifying what a land management program looks for that particular property as we in, uh, include it and introduce it into our greater plan for um, managing these public lands. And in, and in terms of the property, I can take any questions and then um, I assume revisit the Legislative Act here in a few minutes. That was a large parcel of land. I think it's really going to, you know, bode well for what we're trying to do here legislatively. So any questions from uh, for Chad here? Yes, Councillor Buzzard. Uh, Chad, you said uh, open to the public. What, what does that mean? Does it mean everybody? Uh, it means in, in, in some ways, yes. So what we're doing right now is, is um, the greater legis piece of legislation that we're going over is establishing a, a regulatory scheme for managing all of our public lands, taking a hard look at what we have available that has been underused, overused, what's available for conservation, um, and setting regulatory uh, regulations and guidelines that um, make these properties available to the public, but also in a way that maintains conservation. For example, if you have a piece of property um, and you open it, and some pieces of property, if, are, if they're open completely to the public, you might have um, issues with over over harvesting of wildlife and game, which is uh, goes against the conservation uh, efforts that we have. Uh, in this particular property, we were fortunate enough that um, it has participated with the DMAT program for the state of Oklahoma for a number of years, and so I've received a lot of data that I'm still compiling through that identifies what harvest has happened in the past, what wildlife is available, and what the parameters and limitations should be to make um, a healthy take of wildlife and game without, um, without uh, running afoul of conservation. So it, it's going to be open to the public, but I think on this particular property there's going to be more, uh, you know, pieces of it may be completely open, but other pieces of it are probably going to be subject to um, special programs such as you know, youth engagement, veterans, uh, food security, um, you know, COVID response, and elders. It's, it's still premature, and we're, and we're looking for those regulations to kind of hash that out as we go along. Okay. Well, well that's good to hear. I, that concerned me when the statement was made uh, open to the public because I would imagine before we purchased a property, it was not open to the public, and it was open to private uh, parties. So that open to the public yes. statement is concerning to me. But yeah. it sounds to me like you guys are going to analyze it. For sure. Good. Uh, I hope we do. Yes, sir. Thank you. Councilor Duncan. Uh, Secretary, I just want to um, clarify. So open to the public, that's, of course, Cherokee citizens, right? Correct. Not, not the general public. Correct. Right now, well, you know, we're, we're still looking at a number of different options. One thing that has arisen is, um, you know, there's some blended Cherokee families in this area. You have folks who are Cherokee and they have a non-Cherokee spouse, but they have Cherokee kids. As we go through and we look at our programmatic uh, goals, there might be some opportunities for Cherokee families to utilize this property. But of course, with all things we do, the goal is to generate a benefit available to Cherokee citizens. Well, I, I also want to want to take this time to just say, um, uh, of course, I'm a little partial to conservation and wildlife conservation, but this is this is a slam dunk. I mean, it's it's the definition of a great, great thing. Um, and if one, one, one thing to think about, just to my fellow counselors, if, if you have any questions about um, it, it not being fully 
open to, to Cherokee citizens for, for deer hunting or what, whether we do draws or whatever it is. One thing to keep in mind is, is um, wildlife conservation is a part of our culture. Um, it's something that our ancestors have done. Um, we, we're a people of uh, take what you need, only what you need. And unfortunately, we live in a world that doesn't believe like that. We live in a world of, um, no, I, I, I want this too, I want this too. But if we don't manage it correctly, um, it, could, it could be devastating to not only our cultural principles, but, but the wildlife and, and, the, and a beautiful area down there that, that I was fortunate enough to go to. But, so I, I appreciate everything you guys are doing and, and everything you've set up because this is, this is going to be a really big thing for um, creating a, a new generation of hunters, uh, kids that never had the opportunity to hunt or, or uh, look for wild onion or mushrooms um, that they're going to fall in love with. And, and so um, that I just, it's a great thing. Appreciate you. Thank you, Councilman. I, I will say that of, of all the programs I've worked on uh, in my tenure here at the Cherokee Nation, I think this one may be at the top or the top in terms of positive um, response from the public, people reaching out to me for information and uh, expressing that very strong sentiment. <clears throat> Chad, maybe here in the next few weeks uh, when it's a little bit safer, we could give an opportunity for our, for our committee to go down and make a tour. I've had to uh, fortunate time of, of being there already. I mean, we that that is a, that is a huge piece of property, two watersheds. It's absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely. A lot of medicinal purposes there. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm all excited about it, and, and I like what Councillor Duncan alluded to the fact that we know how to take care of land if we do it in the right way. Mm -hmm. Councillor Buzzard. Yes, and, and I think Councillor Duncan cleared up what I had concerns yeah. about when you said open to the public. Uh, I didn't realize that you meant open to the public, Cherokee Nation citizens, though. Per perhaps I should have stated accessible to the public in some ways restricted on certain properties. Okay. Thank that you. should have been probably Thank you for better. clearing that up. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Yeah. Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Uh, Chad, I, want to, I was asked uh, to inquire if it's possible to set some of the property aside for cultural hunting. Absolutely, and so part of this act is it, it speaks to parks, it speaks to wildlands, it speaks to hunting and fishing preserves, um, and it speaks generally and overarching to conservation. Um, and as we go through this act, you can see there's you know one one initial property in particular we're setting aside is um, uh, the uh, Medicine Keepers Reserve, which was formerly known as CMS 83. So in that particular group, you know they've been working for the past 20 years. Um, and, and the group is a very, a very renowned uh, group of Cherokee Nation first generation speakers, uh, and it's one of the it's one of the most regarded groups I think that we work with at the Cherokee Nation, and they've identified a piece of property that has, um, you know, medicinal plants, and they've been meticulously maintaining that in the absence of uh, any type of motor vehicle disturbance, you know, no hunting, no fishing, and and that particular property, you know, we've been looking for an opportunity to set aside for that purpose, and so. You know, in terms of cultural conservation, you know, that's one, one example of a, of a perfect property uh, suitable in this act to be set aside for the use of the medics and keepers and, and restricted in some ways to the public, you know, up to what they think is culturally appropriate in terms of gathering. Um, and, and part of the goal is to identify um, by reviewing all of our land, you know, what, what else we could set aside for that purpose. And, and, and if you read, you know, in the act, the language speaks routinely to primary purpose of maintaining traditional cultural outdoor t activities, and I think that that's going to certainly be a, a big part of what, the push of what we do in the regulatory piece of it. I, I appreciate your answer, but I think what they were talking about was hunting like deer with bow and arrows. Sure. Yeah, so, deer. Yeah. Yeah, so part of the regulations is identifying some of these properties that might be suitable to be set aside for archery only. You know, when you look at land management of this kind across the state, across the federal government, you know, they identified properties for specific uses. A lot of it's based on conservation. You know, what if you have a, a particular property open for rifle, it, it, it results in a, a lot higher take of game, whereas traditional archery doesn't. Um, and, and part of the regulations and, and working with other groups we have, with our, perhaps our education department, our marshal service, is really trying to tie in 
how we can expand these traditional types of hunts and, and with particularly interest in, in engaging children, elders, and veterans. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Councilor, no fire. Uh, <clears throat> how did we decide on this track of land to purchase the 4,300 acres on this specific area? Um, I think, you know, in, when you look at northeastern Oklahoma, finding it 43 acres um, contiguously intact and maintained at this pristine level is not, it's not easy. It's, it's rare. Uh, it's been the goal of the Cherokee Nation, at least as far as I'm aware, that any large tract of property that becomes publicly available uh, gets considered through our real estate services department to evaluate, you know, what the use could be um, and how it fits into the greater plan of, of reestablishing a land base. So, I mean, I was not involved in those particular conversations, but, you know, it, it seems to make, make sense and fit with what I've observed in the past about identifying, you know, properties poised to help um, increase resources for our citizens and also um, establish a land base that we can continue to exercise jurisdiction and make available to the public. Good, good. Yeah, I was interested in how we came up with that. I didn't notice that it was for sale prior to. Um, the other thing is on these preserves, <clears throat> a lot of hunting preserves, uh, in, in fact, whenever you're trying to dedicate that word preserve, you're trying to have to secure that area that and, and keep it intact to where you're not going to have people who are riding all over, cutting fences, whatever. How are we going to secure it? I know a lot of um, preserves are either large enough parcels that you're going to have to have a continuous driving track to make sure no one's sneaking on, or is it going to be a high fence security that we're going to keep this large track of land preserved to make sure that the, 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 the established criteria that we're going to need to implement gets met without other intruders, people sneaking on? So, you know, we, we've, one of the things that I've, I did actually this week was I put together a programming work group uh, that includes, you know, myself, folks from my office, the, the real estate services, uh, the marshal service, and to meet, you know, bi-weekly or weekly to talk about all of these issues, enforcement being one of them. Um, we've identified there's two existing marshals that have, are what you consider conservation marshals, where they have cross-deputization with the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife, and they have special training and special, and special dedicated time for the sole purpose of um, maintaining conservation, which includes wildlife. Uh, I've reached out to them, and, and they've joined our programming team to, to actually hash out what, a, what the regulations are going to look like. I know that, you know, what, the way this act is designed is it's designed to create a, a pathway for regulations to be adjusted and, and adopted for specific properties. Um, it also requires enforcement, which our marshal service can do. I know that a lot of people get confused when they identify the size of this property versus how much uh, law enforcement is available. You know, for example, in, in, in Adair County or Cherokee County, you only have two wildlife officials that manage the whole entire area. And so with the resources we have available from the marshal service, uh, with the resources that we're going to identify and, and put into a proposed budget, which might come back before this body, um, you know, we're, we're identifying what the best practice can be with the resources we have to maintain uh, the integrity of, of that particular property. You know, down the road, it could potentially include a caretaker. It just, it just depends. And so it's, it's really early right now as we evaluate what the best scheme for managing this property is, but that's certainly something that we're um, considering and certainly something that is important. Well, I definitely like that we got land that we're setting aside for this. It's something that, you know, I grew up, that was, that was part of a means and it's become a way of life for our family. It's the way a lot of people in Cherokee 8 or Sequoia County believe. Um, you know, I think it's just, you know, the, the, the food security thing. Um, how are we going to implement that? Because I know, you know, they use CARES Act money to purchase it um, for food security. So that means the citizens that need the food would be the ones that are going to hunt on, on the preserve, or are we going to hunt the preserve and then the land that get the food that gets taken out of that is going to get distributed to the citizens that are in need? I, I think that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're still in the programming phase of developing this. And I think that food security is not the only CARES Act reason for purchasing this property. I, I know we have a plan to um, open it for individuals who might need to self isolate. Um, when you look at hunting in you know, this part of the region, in, in, in 14 counties of the Cherokee Nation, by and large, it is in a lot of times subsistence hunting. I mean, most people go hunt not just for hobby, but as a for source of food, especially in rural communities. 
And so you yeah, better be it, a good shot. That's that's why I had to be. I mean, if I if I was going hunting that morning and I wasn't a good shot, that's not very secure. I'm I wanted to chase them down. So, uh, but yeah, that's those are just kind of the questions I had about how we kind of got the land, what we're going, and I'm glad that we're using it for that. Um, so, but yeah, it's it's exciting to see that we're putting these lands in structure in that way, and, and the security of it's kind of a. I'm sure you guys are working on that. I know. I think there was. Uh, God, I can't remember, nine or 10,000 acres there at Killer Mountain. I think they got high fenced up, and it was a struggle for, he, I think he's an out-of-state owner, to get it up and erect it and secure that area. But it's a pretty cool place when they do things like that. In fact, I, I think he actually mentioned he was going to sell it at one point. Um, but, yeah, it's it's an exciting move to start seeing these things happen. So, but appreciate it. Appreciate it, Jerry. <coughs> All right, good report. We better get back to business. Tell Councilor you Austin. Tell you I know that this act also relates to three other properties. It's not just Correct. one property, and all the conversations really centered around that one property. Uh, I'm assuming the act also uh, ha has the ability to add additional properties sure. as, uh, as something would become available and would be deemed uh, appropriate for this, right? A absolutely. And so... Um, you know, initially, I think that the ask was for me to speak to just the purchase of this property. But if, if it you know if it pleases the body, maybe I could go through and kind of talk in more detail about what this act does and what the goals are, uh, if that if that's okay. I know it's scheduled for item what is it nine, but uh, I that that's the speaker's call. <laughs> I'll take the blame. All right, Councilor Theo. I just wanted to add one little note. You know, there's already an ongoing study down there on the bear. There's three designated bear dens down there, and every every year the federal boys come in there and, and do the cubs and everything, which I thought was a very interesting thing already going on down there. So that's, that's a plus. Okay, good report, Chad. Appreciate you. Okay, let's move down to old business there. This is uh, the discussion. We've had uh, a couple of discussions here. I talked to Councillor Paskowski on this. She wants to uh, take the lead on this and form a work group. If everybody's in favor of that, we'll just turn it over to her. I, I say we usually limit those to about five. Is that right, Shelly, on these work groups? Is that okay? Okay, so we're just going to leave it up to her. So if that's okay with everybody, I need a, a motion to, to approve that. Got Second. a motion? Second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you for that, taking that task on. Appreciate you. Okay, <clears throat> new business number one. Uh, Councillor Vasquez, you want to take that? Yes, sir. This is a resolution confirming the reappointment of Betty Frog, an advisory committee member of the Cherokee Nation, Nation National Treasures Program. I move for its approval. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Councillor Buzzard, you want to take number two? <coughs> Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Item number three. Councillor Jordan, you want to take that? This is a resolution confirming the reappointment of Jan Osti, an advisory committee member of the Cherokee Nation National Treasures Program. And I put that in the form of a motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, all opposed, ayes have it. Uh, Councillor E.O. Smith, you want to take number four? Yeah, this is a resolution confirming the nomination of Lyndon Emerton as board member of the Cherokee Nation Sequoia High School Board of Education. Put this in form of a motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify five, saying aye. Aye. Yes, Councillor Austin. Yes, I uh, want to has stepped away from it at the tender age of 94, I believe. That's uh, our counselor, Mary Baker Shaw's father. And he truly is a legend in this place. And uh, I noticed uh, today there was a press release recognizing him and giving him uh, the uh, uh, title of board member em emeritus. 
uh, as a lifetime advisory. Uh, so we, we owe Eamon Baker a large debt of gratitude for his years of dedication and leadership to Sequoia Schools. I served on the council with Eamon Baker, his former superintendent of Sequoia. He gave his life to that place, so but I think he deserves an applause. <laughs> Thank you for that, Councilor Austin. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, Councilor. Uh, who are the other school board members at Sequoia? Do you know? Right off, I think it's uh, Cheryl Roundtree, Dwayne Marshall, uh, Jeff Limore. Uh, there's one more. I can't think of this lady's name. So there's five? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Councillor Duncan? Yes, Councillor Shaw. Oh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you all recognizing my father. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you all for making this po uh, possible to award him the emeritus status. Uh, my father and my family are deeply grateful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Rightly deserved there. Councillor Duncan, would you take the next one? Uh, yes, sir, Speaker. Um, Evan McLemore has withdrew his name from consideration, so I'd like to make a motion uh, that this legislation be withdrew. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed. Councillor Legg, would you take number six? Wildlands Fishing Hunting Preserve Act of 2021. I'll put this in form of a motion. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed. Number seven, councillors. Yes. Uh, you want to discuss? I thought we just discussed it. Oh, okay. Councillor Nofar. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I was reading through the legislation. I actually got with uh, Councillor Shambaugh, and I, I emailed the other sponsoring councillors just a couple of uh, questions that, that I had on it and uh, made sort of, um, whether you want to call them friendly amendments, I know we, I worked with uh, Tim on it um, to try to draft it right and didn't necessarily think we had to go through a uh, amended agenda and put a resolution on there. I, I think that there are a couple things far as, and I'll go over it with you here, on the subsection 1006, um, where it, mix, where it recommends the uh, principal chief upon recommendation of secretary may designate additional lands. Um, I think that needs, I put in there uh, subject to ratification by the majority vote of the tribal council. Uh, that way the council approves the designated additional property. So whenever they get nominated up through, through um, the secretary of national resources, we would be able to uh, confirm those to make sure that they're uh, germane with what we're trying to do. Uh, subsection 1007, uh, the suspension or revoke any privilege mod uh, and modify the resolution uh, should be done by the council, uh, recommended by Secretary of Natural Resources. And then subsection 1010, uh, which is regulations and procedures. Uh, basically, I, we had talked about maybe making council having prior uh, aware of, of what changes and regulations are going to happen so we can prepare either our citizens or prepare ourselves for what regulations are going to come forward. And then subsection 1011, um, which uh, the chief is authorized to negotiate agreement and execute agreements. Uh, I think he, you know, by all means has the power to negotiate, but when it comes to executive, uh, executing agreements uh, with any entity, um, whether it be 10 years, 20 years from now, we just don't know what's going to happen and how to further protect these lands. Uh, those contracts need to come through council for approval to execute those. Um, so I could hand those out as friendly amendments or we could ask to amend the agenda. I don't know how the council wants to take it. Those were just some of the suggestions that I had spoke and was trying to get to every council member before the meeting came up today. Well, I apologize um, for not. I, I got your email. Yeah, it was I, short I, notice. I was just trying to well, work I thought, on it. In time. Have, have you discussed it with the sponsors? I, I, I sent I sent everyone an email. It was earlier this morning. I didn't get a chance to talk to everyone on the phone. Um, I just wanted to give everyone plenty of time to look at it and see what their thoughts were. And I figured since we're in here, if that's kind of something we wanted to discuss, or or is that something you guys are thinking 
uh, we should look at and, and bring it up at the next council meeting. Um, just trying to figure out the right way we could get some movement on it, kind of, I didn't want to run out of time and feel like I'm pressured to time to get everybody uh, on board with what I was thinking we needed to do with it. Because I think it's, a, I mean, it's uh, by far a great idea in what we're doing. Okay, Councilor Shambaugh, right. you have an opinion on this? Yeah, I, actually, I would like to, uh, I do have an opinion. I'll, I'll give it here in a minute. But, um, Mr. Harshaw, you have anything to say about I, this? I, I do, and so I think one of the things that you have to consider when you look at this legislation is, um, it, it's based on uh, modeled in some ways over what you see on the federal level and the state level. You know, whenever we speak to regulations, regulations by their very nature are not statutes. They're not adopted by this body or by a legislature. Uh, generally, the way this works is the, um, the tribal council or a legislature puts together a plan for a policy saying, you know, for example, with the, the United States of America, you know, Secretary of Interior, you're hereby required to put together a National Park Service. Those parks are added um, into the Park Service through executive actions and through regulations. Uh, same is true with the state of Oklahoma. In the state of Oklahoma, you have the, the state park director that has the authority obligation to put together regulations that speak to land management, conservation. Uh, and the reason why is because, as I mentioned earlier, we've put together a team of people that are uh, top notch to help us understand what these programs are going to look like and what the conservation science is. The conservation is not based on um, in theory on political decisions is based on science. Uh, and so what we have here is modeled in a lot of ways of what you find with, you know, the federal government uh, and the state of Oklahoma. In terms of suspension of privileges uh, and, and the criminal elements that we have here, we have a criminal and a civil component. You know, those issues are, are fines that you receive from a marshal and that are, you know, adjudicated in the courts. Uh, there's not been any, there's not any other example that I'm aware of of a program where you as individual tribal council members would adjudicate criminal activity. I'm, and I'm, I'm not sure that you would want to, at least I, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to you on that. Um, what we see here in terms of regulations and guidelines is pretty fair across other programs. I know this is how I operate under um, the Historic Registry Act. It's, sim it's similar in nature and it's similar with other programs. The Tax Commission adopts their own regulations based on a general law that gives them policy directives and authority uh, to do so. Um, in terms of cooperative agreements, we have envisioned there, um, you know, that, that is typically an executive function. The idea here is that we might enter into an agreement with a veterans association to provide funding and help bear, bring resources to bear on a special hunt. Um, and, and is that something that we want to put through a 45, 60 day hopper? Um, and, and some of that authority, I, I think, is already precedent and being handled in the way that we do through the executive branch. And so, you know, I took great care in crafting this document to reflect what is best practice, what is reasonably applied with, with good government and other jurisdictions, um, and also to make sure that we remove barriers to implement science-based uh, program. And that's, and that's what this intends to do, and I think that's what this version of the, uh, the document does. I think that the, the revisions that were pointed out uh, will certainly complicate this process, um, and uh, I have concerns about how it could continue to be successful if those are adopted. Okay. Um, yeah, I. That's what I was needing. I was wanting to hear from you, uh, from what I get, got out of this. And I th and I see where uh, Councilman's coming from, um, but I'm inclined to um, uh, agree with leaving it how it's written. Um, when I looked at the one portion where we were talking about uh, maybe somebody getting um, expelled or uh, banned from the property. Well, I pretty much knew that uh, that's not for you or for us. That that would be probably a violation of the law. Uh, sure. And that would probably go to be in our court system. A judge would make that determination whether uh, the punishment uh, rose to that for whatever they did. Uh, but there's always circumstances that that need to be looked at, and that person would need to be able to give their side of the story on that, and that would be up to a, a judicial system to decide that. Um, Absolutely. And if I, when I jump down to, I guess, uh, the next one was um, the chief being able to make uh, those agreements. Um, we did this kind of the same thing back whenever the hospital, you know, we were in the hospital, and we had to have uh, some agreements made in a timely manner. They, 
uh, especially with our medical equipment that had to be done or, or we were going to lose the opportunities to do it. Um, we did give him the right to do that. Um, I don't uh, know of this chief ever overstepping his bounds as far as when we've given him that. We, he talked about, you know, it would be on smaller uh, things like that, and, I, and it's my understanding that it would be on smaller things. It wouldn't be anything major, major uh, on this also. So um, I, I just – I think it's fine the way it is, and, but I see where, Councilman, you're coming from. I do. I, I do. Um, and I think if the circumstances were a little different, I would agree with you. But um, I still think, you know, this is a work in progress. And as we get that and as you, and as you show us more of it, I think we'll be able to understand uh, even better what you're trying to, what we're trying to accomplish here as a nation with this land in regards to, uh, the future and our people being able to use it. So absolutely, and if I and if I may respond to that, this section um, about the cooperative agreements is not unique and new to this document. It's it's been included, and in, there's a precedent for this being in other documents, and there's a precedent for you know the chief's ability to enter into a cooperative agreement with for, with, for example C and B or for a nonprofit. I mean that there's there's a precedent for that, and in terms of adjudications, you know this, this is similar to other laws that have been adopted that create a criminal criminal and civil right of action in courts. And it's been my experience that Cherokees are not very shy about going to court, so there's going to be some cases. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I just um, kind of piggyback on what Councilor Shambaugh said. I agree. Um, uh, and I'm glad you, you talk about setting the precedence on, on – as far as contracts and another thing and we went over this during uh, when we were talking about it with the hospital is um, the executive branch already has the authority to enter into contracts on behalf of the tribe uh, the council's ability uh, comes in whenever that's concerning a waiver of sovereign immunity is that correct I mean, I mean correct, the general's sir. here too but Absolutely she's correct. giving me a thumbs up that's what I thought so I I feel like we're getting we're getting to a point where it's getting a little misunderstood and we're starting to step on each other's toes uh, as branches of government. And um, the legislative body, we can't act, we, we can't do the best that we can do if the executive branch is stepping on our toes. And likewise, the executive branch can't do the best that they can do if the legislative branch steps on their toes. So we have to be mindful of how uh, a government is supposed to work and, um, and, and show a little trust because um, I mean, I, I don't, I, I haven't seen anything that, that the executive branch has done that, that w would give us the inclination that we shouldn't trust anything in, in their authority, that they're going to abuse their power because that's not been the case. So um, I, I agree, Councilor Shambaugh, and, uh, and uh, appreciate your work. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, Councilor Coates. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a couple of, of comments, and I want to ask that the, it's, it's slightly different, but my reading of this is, is that maybe it's kind of comparable to um, something in federal government, just, you know, to make a, a, a comparison that is perhaps more understandable, that, um, for instance, the Secretary of the Interior is given a great deal of authority over um, you know, Indian programs and regulating Indian life and to a large degree, Congress has passed it, but the actual regulation of it is given to the Secretary of the Interior, and yet that is not the individual who actually regulates it. It comes down to the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. As I'm kind of reading this, all of that remains in the executive branch, nevertheless. As I'm kind of reading this, I, I think that's more the way that I understand the relationship that certainly the chief has the authority to execute, to, uh, you know, negotiate, et cetera, et cetera. But Secretary Harsha, when you're speaking of science and so forth, that's in your department. That's where your expertise and the people um, who are in your, uh, under you are, are, are really the ones who are going to be uh, formulating the regulation. Uh, is that a fair sort of comparison to make it perhaps more understandable, especially to viewers or others who may have concerns? A absolutely. I think that's a, a very accurate and fair assessment. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I care, this is a carefully drafted document that um, truly reflects my attempt and effort to maintain respects for all three branches of government. 
Um, this document is not, you know, the, 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 the particular pieces that were raised, I, I think, are, are not new. This is how this government operates. It's how most governments operate. Um, and, you know, it, it, that, was, that was the idea here. Now, it's not just me who's going to be uh, administering this program. It's going to be people all around me, people uh, who are much smarter than me on, on, all, on some of these different topics. It's a group effort, which is why, um, as I mentioned, we have a programming team put together to put this program together the right way and make it comparable uh, to what our sister and brother jurisdictions have. Um, you know, we have our reservation and we have tens of thousands of acres of land that are being underutilized, overutilized, um, and we have cultural resources to protect and we have, um, you know, there's no reason why we can't raise awareness to tribal citizens as to what's available because I know I get calls all the time, bring a standardized scheme uh, for these properties, and that's what this attempted to do in the most respectful way, balancing the various interests of the three branches of this tribe. Thank you. And if I could follow up with one other comment, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, I, and, and this is just kind of a, a more generalized comment, but I've heard several people say that they've not had any reason to think that, you know, this administration would ever do anything nefarious, et cetera, et cetera. And I am not in disagreement with that. I, I, I too, you know, don't find any reason to, to think that. But I think that what we all have to have in our minds is that when we pass legislation, those legislations extend beyond uh, this administration. And so while we certainly hope that going forward we don't have administrations, um, that would ever do anything nefarious. We can never be absolutely assured of that. And so I think that um, just as a general thought, um, it would be good to keep that in mind uh, when we're considering legislation. But I agree. Um, I've not seen anything from this administration either that would, would give me reason to mistrust. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> yes, Councilor Nofar. Just a quick follow-up. I'm I got some big feet, but I don't mean to step on anybody's toes. I just simply was bringing up and trying to exercise what I thought our legislative branch. I just brought up a few questions and was trying to get it to some council members beforehand. And uh, I'm glad to hear from Councilor Shambaugh and Councilor Duckin on their opinions on it. That's all it was. And and like Councilor Coates said, it's more. It's not about this administration. It's just passing legislation. And my concern was. What if you get some crazy guy 20 years from now with the wild hair that wants to do something? Uh, I was just thinking maybe of mindset of how could we maybe limit to that possibly happening in the future. And I appreciate your time working on this. And those were the suggestions I had. It doesn't mean that it's a suggestion of this council or the legislative body. It was just mainly suggestions to my fellow legislators of working on this piece of legislation that was handed down to you or, or to us from you. And I'm glad we've walked through those things and discussed those, but by no means am I trying to step on anybody's toes. And if you feel that way, um, well, you know, that's, that, that's never my intentions. And so I try to walk softly with these big feet as I can. But uh, yeah, you know, that, that's the questions I had. I felt like it's good to bring those things up here. And, but uh, you know, it's something I don't intend on doing when I bring forward questions. It's just simply trying to work our legislative body through on these things and that's all that there is mm -hmm. so council those were it. those were good recommendations uh, uh but i feel like it, it didn't warrant any change at this time like councillor shambaugh said this is this is something new and there will be a time where the council can come back and make the appropriate changes once they see that change is needed usually if, if a committee council member wants to make a change to the administration you have to do it in ample time where you give them at least a 10-day notice before these are posted and go to the executive director and give your input. Uh, those, those are the appropriate ways to get change, if there's change is going to be made. And, and I know uh, this, was, this was at the last minute. Usually last minute amendments don't fly with me. Uh, they just don't because, uh, you, you, you know, these things have, like, like our attorney here said, you're, you're the knowledgeable person on this, and we trust you that you took time and used your staff to write this appropriately. That will better the lives of our people. And, and if not, then the, a council can always come back and amend some of this. So that's where we are today. So at this time, I, I suspect that 
we don't need any changes, correct? And we were get, we had a motion, we had a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed. Okay. Now we're down to number seven, Councillor Shembaugh. Sorry. Um, I was trying to get your attention. Joe Bird had, had a comment on, or I'm sorry, not Joe Bird. Joe Deere had a comment he was wanting to make. He had texted Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Deere, I apologize. Uh, you want to make a comment? Yeah, uh, since I was like everybody else on the council just got this this morning and just quickly going over it, and I did talk to Wes and I did talk to Tim, I found that there was a, a couple of areas in section 1010 that maybe looks like the separation of powers between the executive and legislative branch. And I know our job as the council, you know, we need to either pass or go back and forth, but it, it's not our deal to implement it. And I think Chad Harsha, you know, is knowledgeable enough to go forward with that. And I think, you know, if Wes Wilkar wants to come back later, I do, you know, we can do with that. But I, I do agree with what you just said and what other Shambaugh and them say, let's go forward with it. It looks good the way it is. But I said, we, but the thing I'm trying to say is we got to be careful that we, you know, we don't overstep each other's boundary and there has to be trust in that. So this administration has not showed us anything where they would cross over and cross the lines as far as I'm concerned. So that was just my opinion. I thank you for your time, Bird. I appreciate it. Speaker, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Councillor. And thank you, Councillor Nofar. Okay, uh, Councillor Shembaugh, number seven. This is an act amending Title 21 of the Cherokee. This is an act amending Title 21 of the Cherokee Nation Code annotated and declaring an emergency, and I put that in form of a motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. I'll oppose. Uh, Councillor Crittenden, would you take the last one, number eight? Got a motion and a second. All in favor? Like discussion first. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Okay. Any announcements to my right? Any announcements to my left? Okay, our next meeting, uh, February 25th. I guess bring chocolate next time is all I can say. All right, need a motion to adjourn. Yes.